Welcome to Alcohol 101. My name is Maddie with Vandal Health Education and I'll be facilitating this recorded workshop. First, I want to start off by saying that not all U of I students choose to drink alcohol. Some choose to wait until they're 21 and others choose not to drink at all. Choosing not to drink is the safest choice, but for those who do choose to drink, we just want you to be safe. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and the information to help keep you and your peers safer. Let's get started. The standard drink is a unit of measurement of pure alcohol across different alcoholic beverages. Standard drinks helps us to keep track of how much alcohol a person consumes if they choose to drink so that they can track how intoxicated it makes them. Each standard drink has 14 grams of pure alcohol. The standard drink of beer is 12 ounces, 5 ounces for wine, and 1.5 ounces for liquor. You can see on the cup to the right that the more pure alcohol there is in an alcoholic beverage, the smaller the drink becomes to maintain that standard drink measurement. Now, there are a couple different factors that make it difficult to keep track of the number of standard drinks we've had if we choose to drink. The first is variability in the percentages of alcohol in the different types of drinks, as well as the variability in the percentage of alcohol in different types of the same drink. So for example, if a person starts drinking with a light beer, then switches to an IPA with a higher alcohol by volume percentage, it can be hard to keep track of how much alcohol you've had. Pouring drinks into different sizes of cups, shot glasses, or other drinking containers can make it hard to keep track of the number of standard drinks. It's hard to eyeball a standard drink accurately. There may be distractions in the environment that prevent you from keeping track of or remembering how many drinks you've had. Parties with loud music and a lot of people around, drinking games, communal drinks, and other people pouring the drinks are just some examples of distractions. Sometimes folks say that the University of Idaho has a reputation of being a party school and that everyone drinks all the time, when that's just not true. We know from the University of Idaho National College Health Assessment, a biannual survey that measures health and well-being among U of I students, that the majority of U of I students actually drink in moderation most of the time. Additionally, we know that one in five students report never having used alcohol, and that over half of students reported that they did not intend on getting drunk the last time they chose to drink. These figures help to paint a picture of moderation, safety, and responsibility by students who choose to drink, which includes choices like having zero to four drinks the last time they chose to drink in a social setting, and choosing not to drink or to not get drunk. Now let's review BAC and what drinking in moderation, or not, means for our bodies. Alcohol acts as a depressant to the central nervous system. Judgment and coordination, two processes of the central nervous system, become impaired. Alcohol depresses the nerves that control involuntary actions such as breathing and the gag reflex, which prevents choking. A fatal dose of alcohol will eventually stop these functions. So how does alcohol affect us? BAC is defined as the concentration of alcohol in a person's blood. Each standard drink increases BAC by about 0.02 to 0.04, depending on several different biological factors, so alcohol may affect people a little bit differently. For example, each drink increases a 180-pound male's BAC by 0.02, but each standard drink increases a 140-pound female's BAC by 0.03. So several factors determine BAC, primarily how much we drink and how quickly we drink it. But BAC is also affected by your weight and sex at birth. So the less we weigh, the higher our BAC is affected by each standard drink. Now females tend to have less blood capacity than males, so even at equal weights, uh, females tend to have higher BACs since the alcohol is more concentrated in their blood. When we drink regularly at higher levels, we start to develop tolerance. With tolerance, we need to drink more alcohol to get the same results. Tolerance does not change the BAC. BAC still rises for a tolerant person as they drink. It just changes the observable effects. It can be both a risk and a protective factor. While tolerance may enable us to survive at 0.3 BAC, it could lead to other health risks and can even cause death around 0.3 BAC and above. To compare, the legal driving limit is 0.08 BAC. 
Now, when a person reaches 0.3 BAC, alcohol starts to infiltrate deeper into the brain, suppressing vital functions in our body like breathing, not choking, managing body temperature, and making the heart beat. Alcohol poisoning occurs at around 0.3 BAC and can lead to death if the vital functions are shut down. So, why is there such a difference between males and females when it comes to BAC? Nature insists on a few double standards. We know that females typically have less blood than males, contributing to a higher BAC. For example, the average male might have 5.5 liters of blood in his body, and a female of similar, similar build might have closer to 5 liters. So if you were to add the same amount of alcohol to both of those amounts of blood, the female amount of 5 liters would be more concentrated and have a higher BAC. On top of that, Females have fewer digestive enzymes to break down alcohol once it's been drank, so more of the alcohol is absorbed into their blood having not been broken down. This also contributes to BAC rising more quickly in females than males. Our brains get a lot of positive feedback when we drink alcohol. Let's say one drink often leads to feeling good, so logically two drinks makes us feel better, so even more drinks would make us feel even better, and so on. But does more alcohol always equal more fun? Not really. There comes a point if we keep drinking alcohol, and this can happen quite quickly, when things start going downhill and we start to experience some of those not so good things associated with alcohol, like injuries, hangovers, regrets, and alcohol poisoning, to name a few. If possible, we want to keep folks on the left side of the curve, in that green area. So the point of diminished returns is when we start to feel some of those not-so-good things at around 0.05 BAC and above. Remember that alcohol is a depressant, which means that it slows down processes in the body. This means that the more we drink, the more areas of the brain that start slowing down or stop working altogether. Let's consider some reasons why a person may choose to drink. Alcohol is widely cited as liquid courage as it lowers inhibitions. Alcohol is often used in social settings like celebrations, weddings, and birthdays, and some choose to wind down with an alcoholic drink as a way to relax. Drinking alcohol in moderation, which means staying in that green zone of 0.0 to 0.04 BAC, can help folks who choose to drink avoid some of those not so good things that can happen when drinking. Let's review what some of those not so good outcomes can be if too much alcohol is consumed too quickly. Things like hangovers and vomiting, injuries, regrets, there's a long list of potential not so good things that can happen after too much drinking. The worst of all and the most devastating is alcohol poisoning and death. So how can a person sober up after a night of drinking? When it comes to sobering up, there are a lot of myths that just aren't true. The first is caffeine. Caffeine is a stimulant. It makes you feel more awake, but does nothing to counteract the effects of the depressant drug alcohol. All you get when you drink coffee is a wide awake drunk person. Contrary to what some might think, alcohol actually lowers a person's body temperature. So adding cold water by taking a cold shower will only lower the body temperature more. And this could put a person at risk for hypothermia. Going for a walk or a run will increase the chances of physical injury since alcohol decreases the body's control of coordination and it may contribute to dehydration as well. Eating greasy foods to try and soak up or absorb alcohol just doesn't work. Sleeping it off is actually extremely dangerous as alcohol continues to be absorbed into the body as the person is sleeping, continually increasing BAC without anyone's knowledge. This can lead to asphyxiation, stopped breathing, coma, or death. So how can a drunk person sober up? By waiting. Sobriety only comes with time unless there is a medical intervention like having a stomach pumped. The liver can only process alcohol so quickly at 75 minutes per standard drink, and there really isn't a way to make the liver speed up its process. Consider this example. If someone drank until 2 a.m. and had a BAC of 0.2, right around the blackout range, 
their BAC wouldn't reach the legal driving limit of 0.08 until after 10 a.m. and it would take until 4 p.m. that afternoon for all of the alcohol to get out of their system. So if a person has too many standard drinks and not enough time for the liver to process them, there may be more alcohol in the bloodstream than the person's body can handle. Most of us have been in situations that give us that gut feeling that something isn't right, that what you're noticing is something that could lead to harm or is currently harming someone in that moment. And all of us have walked on by or brushed off those situations. But we all have a part to play in keeping ourselves, our peers, and our campus safe. And that includes situations when the not so good effects of alcohol start to come into play. Being an active bystander is noticing that something just doesn't look right and stepping in to help, keeping your own personal safety in mind. You don't have to be a superhero to do something that can have a big impact on someone's life, including preventing injury or saving a life. So how can you tell if someone is just really drunk or if they're experiencing alcohol poisoning? Sometimes if people drink large amounts of alcohol too quickly, they can pass out and their BAC can continue to rise while they're passed out. As the level of alcohol toxicity increases in the brain, automatic functions such as breathing, regulating body temperature, and the gag reflex can shut down. If any one of the following symptoms are present, it becomes a medical emergency which requires immediate medical attention if they have passed out and cannot be awakened, if someone isn't able to be coherent, make eye contact, and is only able to grunt or groan, consider this unresponsive. If they have cold, clammy, pale, gray, or bluish skin, that's considered irregular. If breathing is slow, so fewer than once every 10 seconds, is irregular or stops. If they are gasping for breath, consider this to be irregular. And if they have vomited while passed out and are not responding to their vomiting. Vomiting by itself isn't necessarily a medical emergency. However, if someone isn't able to react to their own vomiting, then it is a sign that several body functions are shutting down and it is a medical emergency. And remember, if any one of these signs are present, it is automatically a medical emergency and 911 must be called. After 911 is called, the unresponsive person must be put in the recovery position. After 911 is called, put the unresponsive person in the recovery position as you wait for medical help. You can do this by putting one arm overhead and lifting the opposite knee up, making the shape of a flamingo's legs. Then place the opposite elbow on their chest and roll to one side. With the knee and elbow serving as kickstands, tuck the other hand under their chin. You can see in the final picture on the bottom right that the person's head is supported and they are less likely to choke on their vomit in this position than they would if they were still on their back or on their front. Once the unresponsive person is in the recovery position, stay with them until help arrives. Try and gather other information about that person's drinking. What did they drink and how much? Did they use any illicit drugs while they drank? Do they take any prescription medications? This information may help the first responders and the medical staff with providing care. The amnesty policy is in place to encourage all students to call for help in the event of a drug-related medical emergency, especially if the person needing help and the active bystander are under the age of 21. Those involved, the active bystander and the person needing emergency medical attention, will not be officially sanctioned for underage drinking or other illicit drug use, meaning they will not have to pay a U of I administrative fee and will not go on their student record, and they will not receive a minor in possession or a minor in consumption charge. But there are some conditions. The person who is transported will be asked to meet with the Dean of Students to discuss the incident and will be referred to the Counseling and Testing Center to meet with a counselor, among any other conditions from the Office of the Dean of Students. So how can we mitigate risk of alcohol poisoning and experiencing some of those not so good things that can happen if we choose to drink? Here is a list of safer drinking strategies that U of I students report using to stay safe while drinking. Some of these things include alternating alcoholic drinks with non-alcoholic drinks, keeping track of the number of standard drinks you have, making your own drinks and keeping them with you, and so on. Read through this list and consider these strategies for yourself or for your friends.
The University of Idaho has resources in place to support students, and I encourage you to access these resources if you need them. File a Vandal Care Report if you feel that a campus community member is in distress or displaying concerning behavior. The reports go to the Office of the Dean of Students, whose staff reach out to the student and help them navigate their situation and connect them with resources. You can file a Vandal Care Report anonymously if you do not want that person to know you're filing it. However, it does help the Dean of Students staff to include your name if they need to reach out for you for more information. You can even file a Vandal Care Report on yourself if you just don't know where to start in getting help. The Counseling and Testing Center is a free and confidential counseling resource for students who feel that they just need to talk to someone. All appointments are online via Zoom or over the phone and can be made by calling 208-885-6716. That number is actually a 24-hour number as it transfers out to another counseling agency outside of U of I business hours and on the weekends, so students always have access to free counseling. Lastly, consider accessing Vandal Health Education's website and social media for more info about alcohol and other drugs. Vandal Health Education offers workshops just like this one to help students make informed decisions about alcohol and other drugs if they choose to use them. We also offer Fresh Start Nicotine Cessation, which is a four-part program offered via Zoom geared to help participants increase their motivation to quit, learn effective approaches for quitting, and guide them in making a successful quit attempt. Thank you for tuning in to Alcohol 101. I hope this information helps you to make informed decisions about your well-being. For any questions related to this workshop, please don't hesitate to reach out to aod at uidaho.edu.